Welcome to The Advocate, where topical issues are discussed in a no-holds-barred manner. In other words, we call a spade by its name. Today, my advocacy is based on the whole clamor for restructuring. A good plan or a plot? Kingsley is here to clarify the difference between a leader and a ruler. Yemi, who joins us for the first time, is taking us on music lessons today as he focuses on the impact of music on the human mind and body. According to Kurt Cobain, the duty of youth is to challenge corruption. And Kemak is here to point out the strength of the African and Nigerian youth. Sit back, your panelists are here to present your Sunday dose of provoking thoughts with no holds barred after this break. Restructuring, a plan or a plot? Pre-election in Nigeria, always a word is picked and beaten up to whip up sentiment and create an electoral nirvana that is void of practicality. This is to say the word has basis, but what exactly does it mean? Or do we share the same definition of the word when we use it in different contexts? The word restructure means a lot to a different lot of people. I will first begin with our definitions of the words based on our vocations in life or politics. To a common man, this will be used from a point of separation of powers from the center, though already provided by the constitution and abused by political party vehicles. To deny governance to the people. I would add at this juncture, the common man gets it but his political inexperience wouldn't allow him clamor for this take. For example, the issue of state policing, we are all aware any separation of power must mean all tiers of governance and arms of governance being allowed to function. On matters like this, the president is mobbed in bare parlor discussions and online keeper terrorists. Meanwhile, this powers to enact such laws is in the powers of the rather lackadaisical National Assembly, whom instead of primarily focusing on bill amendments and oversight of the executive, are yet to be weaned off constituency project feeding bottles. Now we move to the governors. The governors will define restructuring as the free hand to handle state natural resources without influence of the federal government. While these may seem noble, it can't be done till the emperors of state stop the organized kidnap of a tier of government, which is the local government. The state governments confiscate their financial resources. It's like asking nicely for a cookie while your hand is still in the cookie jar. Now we'll look at the federal. This level of government sees restructuring as a harm to its powerful dominance, like a system of control, forgetting that the real power is vested in economic growth and true democracy can only thrive while powers are being devolved properly. It understands the greed of state governors and the federal has used this to their advantage and uses the kidnap of the LG by states to um, twist the state governments for their resources. In times of old, people ran nations for the matter of sovereignty and power. But moving towards the modern times, the only advancement afforded a country is when it is run like a business and every part is contributing to a planned quota of growth. Well, back to the perspectives on a word that has become champion to the opposition and also to the government and a wet dream to the electorate. In my opinion, we always say politics is local. Why don't we ever say governance is local? The inability to understand that the local government is the first handshake of democracy to the people. If we understood what was needed, we would rise for local government police, which would guarantee security at the lowest cluster of governance. We would also rise for its autonomy and would give it rights to natural resources and etc. Let's remember the governance of lo local units live within us and can be held accountable easier than the number one houses in the state or the most protected drive 
in Abuja. So, restructuring. Well, I think, um, like you rightly pointed out, we do have a culture in Nigeria of, you know, spotting and resounding right-sounding phrases over and over and over. And when you look at um, the reality on ground and you look at the advocacy that's going on or the repeated use of these words, it becomes really difficult to tie it together. It seems, like you just said, it's just um, a fad that we throw around, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah rather than going deep into the roots of the issue. It's interesting because personally I have a different idea of restructuring. <laughs> And this is why I have a different idea, because the truth is that in Nigeria, the term One Nigeria is more ideological than practical, mm. right? So what makes us so on is that we share a common territory, mm -hmm. but when it comes to interest, common peoples, the Nigerian interest is highly polarized. Mm. So the problem now becomes, how do you restructure the country in such a way that these different interests are represented properly? So that is why, for me, the idea of restructuring is basically regionalism, okay? For me, what I feel will work for Nigeria is a weak center and strong regions, and this is why I think it's so. You are more likely going to find common interests in the southwest, okay? Mm. You're more likely going to find common interests in the southeast or north central or northwest, right? So when these regions are given a level of political autonomy, mm -hmm. economic autonomy to control their region, you discover that the struggle for the presidency will reduce. Right. Because within the regions, these guys already have a reasonable level of autonomy. It's like what you see in Spain for Catalonia. Mm -hmm. It's like what you see in the United Kingdom for Scotland. These guys have their parliaments. They have a level of economic and political autonomy. So you discover that the clash for the central is little. Right. Because on a regional level, these guys push their own regional agenda do well for themselves and achieve a lot. So I think for me, restructuring is just regionalism, a weak center, and then strong regions. Right, right. and let's not um, fail to realize that Nigeria is a very, very highly ethnicized country. I mean, I think the major thing that polarizes us in this country, apart from the quest for political power, yeah. is our ethnicity. And religion. So, yes, and religion. Of course, yeah. ethnicity and religion are closely linked, and I quite agree. Mr. Mr. Yemi, what do you think about this conversation? Can we hear you? Mr. Yemi? I think I'll just echo what the last, um, what the last uh, you know, advocate said about uh, regional government. Um, from my understanding, the last time we really had uh, an effective system of governance was when we had the the regions uh, prior to the in 1966. And perhaps that's something uh, we should consider again in the future. Because if you have all the resources centered there, are always now giving all the states different uh, pieces of the pie to, to take from. Uh, the, where we are is to probably continue to, to be that way. Yeah, yeah so, um, of course, looking at it, we always say uh, fed, um, state units should be able to function fully. But I think what we, he, we miss, which is key, is that we look at restructuring on a state or a regional level. I feel that if we looked at it on a local government level, mm. If we brought it down to the basic thing, let's look at what's tra uh, trampling Nigeria and our security. Mm -hmm. When you watch the average American movie, you see sheriffs in town. Mm -hmm. The sheriffs in town is local government police. Let's translate it to what it is yeah, in our own Nigeria. system. Mm -hmm. So why are we arguing a state police system? The closest people that you can hold accountable and people that know the areas. Imagine, let's say, I'm from, let's say, Afipo now. Yeah. in eastern Nigeria. Mm -hmm. If policemen are picked to function in Afipo and there are children that grow up in Afipo, mm -hmm. they can spot criminals faster than anybody else. Of course, else. because can everyone knows everyone. In, and that's true, come but, but and you that's know, it would be easier if that level of organization is coming down gradually. No, no, right? you, if, because, you know, because you, start, the, you start from, if you're looking at restructuring, you start from the ground up. You mm -hmm. don't start from the top down. And the reason why I'm most afraid of states Mm -hmm. Having this power, being let it start, let uh, starting it at the states. It's already states have kidnapped financial power of local governments. Yeah. Let you now want to grant them security powers. 
no other opposition will run in that state. With the emperors we have and the powers, governors have clearly this. Just imagine, and now not to mention names, but there's a very excited governor in the in the south south. Imagine him giving a giving a state police. He's going to burn the entire state you down. Know, you know, the thing, the, <laughs> thing, the, 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 the thing with Nigeria is that if you look at it from that perspective, we may miss it right. because Nigeria is highly polarized mm. from the center. Do you get most of the crisis we have in Nigeria, economy, politics, has, doesn't necessarily have to do with the local government. Mm. The problem is that at the center, the, the political interest is polarized, right? So it's more like a context. Why I think regionalism will work is if, for instance, those, the Southwest have their own region, right? The Southwest can say, okay, what can better work for us? What strategy of policing can work for us? I mean, if you look at it, we have things like Amoteku and the Eastern, yes, you know, so I mean, maybe this is a, a good start to if, if they are implemented, yeah. Okay, so um, up next is Kingsley. Stay with us. Leadership versus rulership. Popular American novelist, late Frank Herbert once said, and I quote, good governance never depends upon laws but upon the personal qualities of those who govern. The machinery of government is always subordinate to the will of those who administer that machinery. Hence, the most important element of government, therefore, is the method of choosing leaders. And I dare to ask this question. Do we have leaders in Africa, or are we just ruled by rulers? For me, leadership is summarily the capacity and the will to rally men and women to a common purpose, and the character which inspires confidence. In view of this definition, I like to disagree with the popular saying that Africa is backward because of bad leadership. Because you have to first of all have leaders before you experience good or bad leadership. Suffice it to say that Africa's problem is that she has been plagued by rulership for too long. I like to say that a ruler is someone who behaves like a mathematical ruler. A ruler is rigid and not flexible or adjustable. And the moment you try to bend it, it breaks. A ruler dictates the pace and does not want too many changes. Otherwise, they are bound to break due to lack of emotional intelligence. On the other hand, a leader is someone who behaves like the lid of a pot. Whether you flip the lid upside down or put it in the way it's supposed to be, it will still get the job done. That being said, a leader is a person who is flexible and allows creativity in his or her workplace or constituency and has high emotional intelligence to back that up. In another perspective, rulers are those who rule. To rule is to control, to direct, to impose rules, to dominate, and to exercise ultimate power and authority over an area or its people. In contrast, leaders are those who lead. To lead is to guide, to direct on a course, to serve, to take responsibility, to represent, and to be on the forefront of positive change. Not the kind of change APC brought to Nigeria anyways. Leaders have leading fo willing followers while rulers have dominated subjects. Rulers impose their authority. Leaders, on the other hand, can end their authority as a matter of expertise, emotional intelligence, and people-orientedness. Essentially speaking, good leadership is not about power, benefits, or exercising authority. It's about guiding people to a common purpose in a way that represents common interest. It's about the people and not about the leader or the power. And that is why in same continents and countries, leaders resign when they lose favor with the people who elected them to represent their interests. In Africa, however, resignation does not exist in our political lexicon. Most democratically elected presidents in Africa think like monarchs. They would rather die than relinquish power before their tenure elapses or before they are violently ousted from power. Now, it's possible that Africans in general and Nigerians in particular may have found normalcy in rulership. But like Louis Blackwick once said, and I quote, a day may come when all hope is lost, when the oceans run red with our blood and our darkest hour is upon us. And when that day comes, the red day of reckoning, we turn, my dears, not to our rulers in good times, but to our leaders in bad times. 
Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I'll just quickly chip in here, uh, and I'll say that rulers and leaders are non-identical from one another. So you have rulers, uh, people who tend to rule. A ruler can't be, you know, simply a smaller controller. A uh, ruler normally rules over the individuals against their will, just to tell them what to do. People tend to do it because of the power that emanates from this individual. There's no charisma, there's no personality attached to it. It's just the power, pure power. And they use power of authority. And the very purpose of a ruler is to rule people's lives. On the contrary, I'll say leaders are individuals who lead and they tend to lead by example. They attract followers using their strength of ideas. Uh, while whereas uh, rulers uh, are quite poor in the, in the idea management side of things. Leaders don't demand allegiance. They use the power of attraction, like I said. Uh, ru rulers tend to be arrogant, but leaders are modest and always stay open to suggestions. So a leader can have a suggestion which uh, might seem in, in his or her head uh, something that is very uh, smart, uh, but having considered other people's opinions, is liable to change it, might not be immediately, but you know, open to suggestions and doesn't believe he's the smartest or she's the smartest person in the room. Uh, I can't say rulers are leaders, but not. I can say that rulers are leaders, but not all front runners are rulers. Right. Thank so you. I'd like to come from another perspective. perspective now, I, yeah. I tend to be a non-conformist. Yeah. Right? But the thing about leadership, leadership is not soft. It's not flaccid. Yeah. It's not um, it's not indecisive. Leadership does not pander to emotions. Yeah. And I think that's uh, when we come at this issue of separating leadership and rulership, yeah. that we come from that perspective of emotion or sentiment. Yeah. Oh, a leader knows how to appeal to followers. A ruler is firm. The truth is you can't separate leadership from rulership. Because in assuming authority, yeah. in assuming a forefront position over other human beings, you, there are times you have to put your foot down. You have to assert your voice. You have to assert your opinion. You have to assert your authority. So I think um, in a nutshell, it's yeah. about semantics and okay. personal feelings, sentiment. When we try to separate leadership from rulership and say one is good or the other is bad. I tell you the truth. It's worse mm. to have a leader at the helm that seems to have no direction or has not the power to insist and, you know, move people into a particular direction for the greater good. I don't want to, you yeah. know, mention names yeah, or yeah, yeah. give, um, but it's a lot easier to have a firm leader, someone who, based on the descriptions, you call a ruler yeah. who is not really in tune with the needs of his people, but moving us in the direction of progress. Okay, That's I, I think, I think a, a good leader should be able to combine firmness with people-orientedness, right? It's like the difference between the, the difference between rulership and leadership in mm. this context is like the difference between democracy and autocracy. In a democracy, why the leader is looking forward to protect the interests of the people who have elected him, He's also, he also understands that there are times when, as a leader, you have to be firm and stick to your decisions. Unlike in the other system, where what people want is not really important to the leader. Mm -hmm. The leader has absolute power. Okay? Mm -hmm. And the idea behind this is, in Nigeria, we have elected people who seem to be doing what they want to do, and not necessarily what the masses want them to do. You know, for me, mm -hmm. I'm going to come from a governance perspective. Mm -hmm. First... I don't agree we have leaders in Nigeria. I'm of that perspective, I'll tilt to, to Kemak's uh, perspective. So what we have in Nigeria is that we have people in political position and not a government. Mm. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, and if you look at the trace of everything, last leaders I think Africa had were pre-colonial era. We cannot mm. say the colonialism structure did not leave do a number on our thought process. Right. Yeah. I yeah. So I look yes. at I look at the early leaders in Africa as um, Shaka Zulu, who wasn't mm. even who wasn't even a softy. Right. Yeah. But, you know, leadership. But they commanded that mm -hmm. and that, yeah. if, if if there's anything you're going to pick from leadership for me, that why I would look at leadership comes with charting a course. Mm. Exactly. Every leader had a course. You can pick leaders from different times. Alexander the Great, he wanted to expand his nation. You know, Napoleon. Yeah, they yes, there was a clear vision. There was a clear vision. 
Queen Amina of Zaria took her kingdom from Zaria, which is in northern Nigeria, extending it up to Ghana. She died somewhere yeah. in Ghana. Right. She was killed in a war somewhere in Ghana. And that was leadership. Yeah. So, but when the colonials came in, and we cannot divorce them from this, yeah. they taught us how to follow the gunpowder. Because then you'll be like, okay, you have your gods. We have one true God. And if you argue with them, mm -hmm. guns. Yeah. So we've gone, to, we've gone to that level. It's gotten so bad that I'll give an example with the National Assembly. National Assembly summons the president on, um, on um, security matters. And the attorney general of the federation comes out and says, you can't summon the president. Yes, in the constitution, it's not written anywhere. But mark you, in the act that creates, also in the same constitution that yeah. creates the National Assembly, it states that the National Assembly can summon any Nigerian at any point in time. Yeah. As long as the presidents in Nigeria. So we don't even understand this thing. Yeah. I think we, we're just used to the gun approach. Exactly. So we have, we have a lot of so, people right. in politics who are not in governance. Yes. Yes. And that's a like big problem. In political position. In political politics, but right. not in <laughs> governance. So the problem is Professor Piero Lumumba of um, is a Kenyan legal luminary. He once made a statement some years ago. I was listening to him. He said that the problem with Africans is that Africans have a lot of affinity for people without ideas, mm. right? During elections, you see people who have powerful ideas about how they want to transform the nation or the continent, the charts they, they want to take the nation to. But you discover Africans going for people who have political and economic clout, choosing them over people who have ideas. And that is why, at the end of the day, we end up electing people politicians and not leaders because people can't give what they don't have Absolutely. right if you don't have an idea you don't have something you want to achieve you don't have a clear vision once you get to that power you discover that at the end of the day you just end up exploring the power mm. and not necessarily doing anything with government there's something key I, I always think about especially in nigeria maybe because i've run for office before i kind of understand this funny part about um Af nigerians Nigeria's problem is that they don't, it's not that they don't know which politician is good or not. Mm. They do. They clearly do. They always do. Yeah. The problem is that the entire Nigeria sees Nigeria as a buffet table and everybody's waiting for his turn oh at the Lord. buffet. <laughs> yeah. So what happens is, what happens is, ah, oh, no, I won't distort Mr. A while he's in power because me, I want to chop my I own. I want to chop oh, my own. And, and, I don't know, this guy, I mean, this guy wants to stop appeal everything. appeal to the, you know, the electorate or just the It appeals to the elect and... electorate because I'll give you an example. You enter power today, I can tell you, your cousins are going to come from the village to Abuja. Where's our contract? Where's our this? Where's our official car? Where's this? Where's that? And we don't want it to spoil because if someone now comes in and says, if someone now comes in and says, okay, I'm going to stop official cars, I'm going to stop uh, all all people in governance are going to be any minimum wage. Uh, right. It's you like, are, is it my own turn? Of, uh, is you know, turn speaking about what I remember once coming down from a hotel, I was coming out of a hotel, and then I saw a car drive in, and then everyone was like, and then I looked at the man at the back of the car. He, he looked like one of the governors in the South South. Yeah. And I was like, oh, is this not this governor? And as he came down from the car, and I was like, your excellency, your mm. excellency. Your... But I said, the, the, the resemblance is not really there. Mm. Guess what? He was a younger brother to the governor. <laughs> And I, I almost lost my mind. Like, I was living with me. I can already tell you. I was living with And you know, he was accepting all the accolades and responding to the Your Excellency calls. And I said to my assistant with me, like, what kind of a joke is this? Oh, no, that's you interesting. Know, you know, even for that, that's even a, a little close, the brother. Well, we have people that are barbers to His Excellency oh, in Governor, and they have business cards. I know, right? it's, 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 okay. no, it's, it's really a sad thing. It's time to take some of your comments on the issues discussed here. Ohale Odehora says, Reforming the Nigerian constitution is important. Define a new vision from our country. Pull out all the reactionaries, wherever the base, education, healthcare, energy, transport, and put the interest beyond the demand of the citizens. Phantom 2K10 says, great build, great minds, and great platform. Now follow us on our social media platforms on Facebook at Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG, or on Twitter and Instagram at Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plustvafrica.com slash The Advocate NG. It's time for our music lessons with Yemi, but only after this break.
I'll start with a quote from possibly uh, the greatest musician, uh, in my opinion, uh, Felakuti. And the quote goes, goes this way. With my music, I create change. I am using my music as a weapon. Let's talk music. Let's talk about the impact of the mind, body, and soul. Firstly, the music, the little music history. According to the Oxford Dictionary, music is vocal or instrumental sounds combined in such a way as to produce beauty of form, harmony, and expression of emotion. Secondly, it is the written or printing, printed signs representing vocal or instrumental sound. Some schools of thought opine that music began about 40,000 years ago, although this may even be much further. Some say the Greek philosopher Pythagoras invented music. However, in terms of music history, there are six periods, which I'll briefly touch on. You had the medieval period between 1150 and 1400. Instruments created during this period were the flute, recorder, which is still in, in existence today. The organ, not so much. Then we had the Renaissance period between 1400 and 1600. Instruments uh, created during this period were the trumpet, the guitar, tambourine, and the small guitar. The Baroque period was between 1600 and 1750. Instruments again, oboe, violin, viola, and the cello. The classical era between 1750 and 1820. That was the introduction of the piano. The romantic period was between 1820 and 1900. And that's when you have the bigger orchestras that are still in um, use today and the national music schools uh, uh, from, from that period were created. And then finally, uh, the 20th to the 21st century, which is what we consider modern music now, impressionist, expressionist, modern, postmodern, and contemporary music, including our Afro, Afro beats. Uh, according to numerous sources, which include philosophers, doctors, anthropologists, just to name a few, music asserts a powerful influence on we humans. It can help us with lightening our mood, reducing anxiety or stress, reducing depression. It can be a sleep aid. Some people need it to sleep. It helps them listen to some classical music, some jazz or some gospel. And for working out when we're in the gym. Now, I would like to talk a little bit about the impact of the mind. Although this is a longer list, I'll just touch on four ways music affects the brain. Emotion. Uh, from a mother singing a song to a newborn baby or father uh, to an instant uplift in our mood when a favorite song is played on the radio or in our car. Music helps us to have a direct impact to a person, place, period, or event. Memory. It's been a proven technique for sufferers of Alzheimer's, uh, as well as a few other ailments to help people regain parts of their memory and improve their mental health. Learning. In a groundbreaking study by the University of, of New, Newcastle in Australia some years ago, popular music was used to assist patients with severe brain injuries in recalling personal memories. Attention. Certain types of music while affecting our mood can also distract us or make us inattentive to tasks at, at hand. Some are unable to study without music and some need it as a break away from too much work. Research has shown us that when a subject listens to music that gives them the chills, it triggers a, a release of dopamine to the brain. Dopamine is a kind of naturally occurring happy chemical we receive as part of a reward system. Now here's really the interesting part. Dopamine is not only released during peak musical moments, but also when we anticipate those moments. It's like when you're, the favorite chorus of your song is coming out, you know, there's this reaction that you have, uh, it's called dopamine. It's like our brain is rewarding us for knowing a really great chorus is about to hit. Now, impacts to the body. According to the Harvard Medical Review, doctors tell us that music can enhance the function of neutral networks, slows the heart rate, lower blood pressure, reduce levels of stress, hormones, and inflammatory 
cytokines and provide some relief to patients undergoing surgery, as well as heart attack and stroke victims. Yeah, like I said earlier, music can also be used for workouts. Why not having a direct impact to the endurance? It helped to increase tempo. Now, finally, I'll just talk about the impact to child development. Music ignites all areas of child development and skills for school readiness. Don't believe me? Get your children involved with, with, with piano classes, guitar lessons, or even the drums. It helps with intellectual, social, emotional, motor, language, and overall literacy. It helps the body and the mind work together. Exposing children to music during her early development helps them to uh, get used to the sounds and meaning of words. Finally, music helps to build pride, confidence, and memory retention. Thank you. Really, um, a recent research in the United States of America found that music actually helps with easier assimilation in the classroom for children. So there's an ongoing advocacy that classes should have soft music playing on the background while you know classes are going on or children are studying and stuff like that. But it's, um, I, I wouldn't want to say it's a dime a dozen, but I think, like he pointed out, different people differ in their you know, reaction or reception or perception of music. Now, mm. something really funny happened in my office yesterday. So there's a song I like. It's by David Do, um, Holy Ground. So mm. now one of my assistants was playing that music and I found I was vibing to it, like really singing along, enjoying myself. Now I went back into my space and tried to do some work. And I found out it was just really difficult for me to concentrate. And then when my conscious mind came to the fact that the young man has started playing another song that I did not really find, you know, personal pleasure in, I quickly shut him down. I said, look, you're distracting me. Put off that music. This is an office. You can't play that. You know, you can't play such songs. Here. And then three seconds later, I, my mind went back to the fact that, oh, this same person played a song that I really liked like a few minutes ago. Yeah. And I did not realize it was an office and he couldn't play such music at the office. So I think it's all based on personal... Um, Perception. For yes. Me, for me, it's different. Um, okay, I'm in governance now. So I, know, um, I loved music growing up, music of 90s, but I was always introduced to music. My parents were music lovers. So I grew up with think, listening to people like The Temptations, Isaac Hayes. Mm. Uh, 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 no, before that, long before that. I'm talking of Tom Jones, oh, wow. way back. And I, I came up to that. And I'll tell you, some of the first big words I even knew came from rap. I was a notorious B.I.G. fan. And you know, he knew how to mix words together. And most of the time when I speak now, people are like, okay, he has a control of his Lexus. But I'll tell you, it came from rap music. The fact I could put words together, like I, yeah, and most people wonder. So I, I feel I've gained so much from music. Yeah. For me, music has even been knowledge for me. Because there were words like, I remember I didn't know what licorice was till Notorious B.I.G. said it. It's actually something sweet. Uh, sweet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you get to learn all these things along the way and you, and you get to listen to music. Yeah, I don't listen to very, very modern music yeah. now because it's kind of gibberish. I don't, not gibberish, but I don't understand it. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I, I'm more into older music that, and I know how it has That brings me to something because I like to talk about the societal impact of music. Right. Now, I'm a very young person, but growing up, music used to be a tool of transformation and education. Mm. Music had a message. When you listen to music, it had a message, okay? The artists were either passing out a message, trying to change mindsets, trying to change perspective, right? So beneath that entertainment was a message mm. behind every music, but in contemporary times, we discovered that music has been reduced to entertainment and sensationalism. Okay, well, I'm sorry to cut you short, but I absolutely <laughs> do not really agree with that in that sense, right? Because, I mean, at the end of the day, it's what you're able to squeeze out from something that it will yeah. mean to you. Like, I get what yeah. you're saying. Like, when we talk about the Onye Kanwe news, the, no, not necessarily. Like, the sunny days that had, you know, like, uh, social messages... Backing up them, or even the fellas. Let me give you an example. 
You can find the song trending, mm -hmm. and what is the lyrics? See Mary, see Jesus, see Mary, see. Oh, yeah, right. You can like, find another one trending. It's a call your mama, to your spiritual your consciousness. <laughs> when you talk about see Mary, no, no, it's not spiritual. Call. <laughs> what I'm talking about is, in the past when I was growing up, you couldn't see such songs trend. These days, what people look more at is beating. Once the music has very solid, yeah, you know, yeah. and really that's what uh, you know makes them calms them from the exactly. You know what my answer is to that? I would always say every time, and I must try not to be biased. Every time has what its music is preaching. Oh right. Yeah. Um, I think one of the most intelligent scholars in the 14th century in the UK said, um, "Give me the folklore of a people, and I will direct its laws." Mm. I can't remember his name. Very intelligent guy. Because the truth is, if I hijack the folklore of this generation, I'll be able to direct this thought process. So I'll give you an example. If, um, let's say, a big musician, I don't want to call any names. If a big musician decides to pick up a social consciousness topic and then pushes it forward through his music, he'll be able to direct where the people are heading and choose where the electorate thinks. Absolutely. And Kemak is up next after the break. Youth and the power of change. In recent times, we have seen an uprising of young Nigerians and Africans in a never before experienced uproar, occasioned by the protracted seeming inability of governments to provide an enabling environment for young people to thrive. As a development consultant, every day, I engage scores of young people in discussions hinged on their personal ambitions, career projections, and general pulse about life and living in Nigeria. Needless to say, 10 out of 10 young people live in abject despondency concerning their ambitions and dreams in Nigeria. In my work engagements too, I have had reason to interact with the top echelon of society, the so-called big men and women. The disparity in living circumstances between these two groups it's not only glaringly alarming, the dissonant gaps that exist between these demographic divides seems to have no bridging in sight. With an arguably eroded middle class, Nigeria presents at best a morbidly unwell social construct, which if not urgently checked will result in, I reserve my comments. I do not necessarily want to delve into the myriad mental health issues that these feelings of utter hopelessness produce. But my focus today lies in the question, how can young people galvanize their power and collective goodwill toward engaging the socio-economic, political, and structural systems of Nigeria as a whole? Galvanizing saying in order to produce an Eldorado of sorts, or at the very least, a land they can be proud to call their own. A land that gives them hope for today and assurance for the future. A place where dreams are not daily met with the possibility of death. A country where the aspirations of young people are not too easily crushed by the seeming indifference of successive governments to the plight of their greatest strengths, the youth. Much as we may want to move away quickly from the horrors that till the end SARS protests, this phenomenal expression of the strength, unity, and glory of youth, in my opinion, should be properly harnessed and channeled to outputs and outcomes that not only provide a pedestal for positive youth engagement, but ultimately change systems, improved governance, and consequently improved life outcomes for the people. Sadly, it seems our youth find greater satisfaction with simple campaigns, some of which are violent, aggressive exchange, and a never-ending cycle of mob action. While these are somewhat applied and found to be commonplace as expressions of quest for change globally, what next becomes the question after all of the upheaval? How do we channel the voice of youth unrest 
into outright tangible, productive, and sustainable yeah. change in Nigeria, Africa, and the world at large. Quite an interesting read. And Mr. Yemi, what do you think about this conversation, uh, especially as a Nigerian who is based in the UK? What's your opinion or perspectives on this issue? No, it's a, it's a good point. And I like the fact that he briefly touched on, on NSAS without going into detail. Uh, but we saw what can be achieved when people come together for um, you know, a plan. We, see, we saw unity. We saw the use of social media and technology. We saw uh, large sections of people um, from a certain age demographic um, coming together uh, to for a common purpose uh, with, with 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 the demonstrations and protests that went went on but to your question how can it be um, how can it be challenged you can only I think you can you to, to get to the future you have to understand the past first and foremost and then align and change the present to get to the future if you try as if you if you you can't do it with will with willpower alone uh, but we know that the youth have the ideas they have the energy they have the creativity they have the innovation they have the imagination and they have hope um, what they don't have is experience uh, and i feel you know in a country like nigeria if you rush that change it might not end uh, too well, like like one of the other advocates uh, said, it has to be something that you have to have a plan, a, a long term vision, uh, with a not so much emotion, a little bit of emotion because you are aggrieved about certain things not working properly. But you have to have a plan in terms of okay, how do you want to represent yourself? Do you have a ten year plan to say okay, like uh, the other advocate said? Let's start from the bottom up and the top down approach. Do we want to take some certain seats in some certain elections because we want to have political power and then grow that over a period of maybe two or three election cycles? Because you don't, if you just channel all your anger to the streets, uh, you don't want a situation where it ends in, in violence, whether it's state, state sponsored or, or otherwise. I think in the last um, few years, we have seen the youth show their own um, concerns and uh, you know their apathy to certain actions within the state. But I think that has to be channeled. Um, you, 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 youth advocate groups around the country are being formed. They have been formed. And perhaps it's one to go back um, and then learn the lessons of the past and look for a new way forward. I, I think in my view, what is most pertinent is after looking at the kind of directions and things that have happened in Nigeria, especially during the NSARS, the NSARS situation is something most people did not know. Yeah, you got a lot of people in Lagos, in different states, on the streets. But do you know that that number is enough to recall this entire State House of Assembly in Lagos and in all those other states? Mm. So I believe political literacy is key mm. to moving forward. It's hard to explain to Nigerians when you tell them, okay, you're not politically literate enough. Mm -hmm. But imagine if they took out, that's um, by recalling, that's what I mean by the takeout, yeah. took out the entire state house I of mean, assembly. You need to no, that. I have to clarify that. <laughs> so if they took out the, the entire state house of assembly, yeah. You can take out a governor or you can impeach a governor for inaction. Mm. Yeah. And that will send a message to the center they will never forget. Yeah. We need to understand the constitution, how our country works, and what exactly could work. Uh, so looking at the Aram Spring and Co., yes, there's the front, which looks like the agitation streets, mm. but there's also the strategic the at the back end. Yeah. And I think that's what's missing. Okay, here. exactly. I think... I agree with you, especially that the fact that the problem when it comes to youth participation is the fact that we're missing out on the strategic part. Now, this is what happened during the NSAS campaign. A vast majority of young people were on the streets, but the vast majority of people in the corridors of power were older people, right? right? Because the truth is, 
for the interest of the youth to be represented, let's come to the reality. The youth must be there to represent mm -hmm. their interests. Mm -hmm. So the solution yeah. is simple. Young people have to start getting involved. Right? You talk to an average young person in Nigeria, he or she feels governance is not their business, politics is not their business. He or she has visions of becoming CEOs of companies, becoming things. But when it comes to politics, you discover that young persons walk away from politics. Right. Those people there are, like you said earlier, occupying political position and they will represent their own interest mm -hmm. until they are no longer there. So... I right. think it's an organic process, right. right? Young people need to start getting involved in politics from the grassroots because it will always get to a power is never given. It has to yeah, be taken. It's taken. Yeah. And I believe that's where he mentioned about political literacy. Yeah. I think that's the first mm -hmm. step. When people understand the correct process, how to go about things, during the NSAS advocacy, I was constantly on, you know, speaking on the need to engage strategy. Yeah. You know, it's like in development, you have programs and you have a project. Yeah. Now, the project is what gives longevity and sustainability to the programs that you do. So your programs are like activities that you carry out. Yeah. But that alone cannot stand and bring structural change like we, you know, we deserve. And like you've, you've mentioned, which is something I realized during the NSAS protest, the refusal of the young people to come to the negotiation table. Yeah. The truth is, except you're going to have a coup d'etat, even if it's the <laughs> devil that is sitting on that table, you have to engage yeah. the powers that be. And it has to be systemic, it has to be strategic, and it has to be with the goal of sustainable you know, change. Yeah, and it was difficult during change. the NSAS campaign it because was. we are now depending on Twitter influencers right. to engage That's the government. Activity. Because they you know what you know what I find uh, most odd about the whole matter. I remember a common saying during the NSAS, and when I saw it, I was really hurt. And it meant uh, what the old people cannot see. We will use drone, and everybody joked about it. Right. And I was like, come, this is, this, is a, this is an IT generation. Yeah. You know that a drone can only go where the mind of the person All controlling right. it knows. Yeah. So it doesn't change. And actually, this statement came from someone who's serving in government who is older. So he was, he was even mocking mm. the fact they taught in that process. Yeah. Yeah. Let's understand. The people in power right now, and I heard this when I was in dinner in South South, and I was with some politicians, and they said something to me. We took over power from our fathers who didn't go to university and who lived in a hamlet. I said, we were schooled in America, ETC. Do you think you want to take power from us with university degrees? You're going to come with, without a plan? Oh, well, <laughs> time is never our friend on this program. However, the advocacy continues on our social media platforms on Facebook. That's Plus TV Africa with the hashtag TheAdvocateNG or on Twitter and Instagram at Plus TV Africa with the same hashtag, the Advocates NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, you may log on to www.plustvafrica.com forward slash the Advocates NG. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. Till next week, same time on this station. Remember, the important conversations are among the necessary tools for a saner society. Bye for now. Bye.